Coming up today, stocks finished the weekend month of August higher. Is this like 1995 again? Why the tide is turning in China? Inflation keeps cooling. A depressing chart. Lessons from Warren Buffett who just turned 94. How golf and investing are similar. And what to do now that the number one recession indicator is flashing. You don't want to miss this one, guys. Let's go. And so it turns out, once again, option dealers were right in pricing and low volatility today. Inflation coming in as expected, and we actually just finished the week and the month of August higher. Not many people would have thought we'd be in for a higher close this month, just a few short Mondays ago on the 5th of August. And we actually just put in the second highest ever close for the S&P 500 today, 56.48, only higher the middle of last month on the 16th. Looking very likely we're going to break out to new all-time highs next week. Market color is confirming that. Pretty wide bullish breadth and participation. After we continue to see a rotation, even after earnings and the market's reaction to Nvidia was pretty soft and weak, closed down yesterday over 6%. However, the rest of the market didn't seem to mind too much, and that's a classic sign of a bull market. Money rotating out of one sector or a certain group of stocks into other groups of stocks, which is typically a good sign. However, stick with me today because we did just get one of the most significant indicators starting to flash today, telling us that a recession is just around the corner. I'm going to show you what that is in a bit and what are a range of outcomes we could expect from that just looking back in history. I think you'll find that really interesting. Warren Buffett turns 94 today. Market just handed him a great birthday present, sending his shares Berkshire Hathaway to all-time highs. Also this week, hitting the trillion dollar club. For the first time as well. Stick with me and I'll show you some important life lessons and my favorite quote from Warren Buffett later on as well. Also later on in this video, I'll draw some comparisons between golf and investing, which I think you'll also find interesting given the amount of similarities. Also going to be talking a little bit about China today and why I think the tides are turning over there and they're really starting to get underneath their markets. Could be setting up really good bullish opportunities for us investors. And also keep in mind, US stock market is shut this coming Monday in observance of US Labor Day. It's a long weekend for the stock market. So next week will be a shortened trading week. Going into the important jobs report next Friday, I'll also give you my thoughts on that a bit later on and how it may impact Jay Powell's decision on interest rates next month. And so starting on Tuesday, we'll be trading in the month of September, historically the worst month of the year. Looking at the average monthly change in the S&P 500, actually comes in negative. A lot lower than February, which is another low performing month in the stock market. And one thing I'll be paying attention to is whether Nvidia can break out to new all time highs. Because even though we've got a healthy rotation going on in the stock market, there's even the chance Nvidia could fall over. We've already seen the all time high for at least for a few years and the rest of the market can hold up. However, at the very least, it does hold significance for the important sector of semis tech and the AI theme as a whole because they did deliver a pretty good quarter did beat Wall Street expectations they did guide up maybe not as much as the most bullish expectation the biggest customers are still indicating a lot of spend there's a little worries of their new Blackwell chip production however that doesn't seem to be a real big issue at the moment but one thing's for sure if it does fall over and we take out hundred dollars a share and that's the price action market reaction and trend we get after a pretty good quarter, then that's not a good sign. That's a bad reaction to good news. Typically, the most bullish thing you can see is a stock rip on bad news. So if we get the opposite, the stock fall off on good news, that's not a good sign for, like I said, at least semis and maybe the NASDAQ as a whole, even if small caps value international and the rest of global equity markets can still hold up. Because not only is their business still performing really well, they can now engage in a little financial engineering, start buying back their own stock, increasing it by $50 billion. That's a double the $25 billion buyback they announced a year ago, which still has $7.5 billion remaining on it. And so they've already bought back nearly $15 billion in stock during the first half of its fiscal year. And stocks that engage and big buybacks, they just correlate with good performance, something short sellers don't like to go against. Typically short sellers target the opposite. Companies are issuing a lot more shares, increasing the size of the register. That leaves room for attack on a stock. And so it's easy to see why there are some analysts out there that are liking this moment to 1995, which at that time in the mid 90s, I think it was early 96, Alan Greenspan, then Fed chairman, really widely respected at the time, came out with his famous headline that the stock market was in a period of irrational exuberance. NASDAQ went on to triple in the next five years after he said that. And so that's the ongoing debate with Nvidia this year. Is it 1995 or is it 2000 Cisco? And this is what makes markets so challenging and interesting because no one knows for sure what part of the cycle we're in with AI. And it may not even be anything like 1995 or 2000 could be something completely different. Market could trade sideways for five years, something pretty much no one's predicting. And even though history often rhymes, 
doesn't always exactly repeat. There's always different nuances each time. Back in the mid 90s, we didn't have a huge yen carry trade like we do now. With the Bank of Japan widely expected to stick to its tightening campaign, and they're really in a tough spot. Just got their interest rate to 0.25%. They've got so much debt to GDP, if inflation gets out of control there, they could absolutely bankrupt themselves by having to lift rates to counteract inflation, skyrocketing public's interest expense on all their debt. Pretty much been a zombie economy for the last 30 years, ever since they peaked out in the late 80s. And so if they come out and hike again, and we've got the Fed cutting, that's narrowing the gap between the two major economies' interest rates, and the yield on a yen carry trade goes down. So will the pricing, and that could cause another unwinding episode. Like we saw on the 5th this month, could very well happen again. And so over the last couple of years, Japanese equities have been performing really well. Not so much for their nearby neighbors in China. Their market's been in a multi-year bear market. Big issues with their property sector. Big regulatory clampdown from their government. Started getting worried how big and powerful their tech companies were becoming. Saw what was happening in America and their tech companies' ability to influence political outcomes. They pretty much shut down Jack Ma from Alibaba. Cut him down to size and with it, his stock price as well. And there's a look at a 10-year monthly chart of Alibaba ever since it came on to the New York Stock Exchange. Exactly 10 years ago, September 2014, you can see it peaked out $320 a share in late 2020. And then the government clamped down started, absolutely clobbered the stock, had a peak to trough drawdown, 82%. However, in that 10 year period, the revenue from the business has gone up tenfold. And according to my indicators, it's very undervalued. Did 131 billion in sales in the last 12 months. Market cap, 195 billion. It's pretty much the Amazon of China. And Amazon's pretty much got 10 times the market cap of Alibaba. However, I think the tide is turning. We've seen a number of key developments starting late last year when Xi Jinping first flew over to America, had a meeting with business leaders, CEOs. It was obvious to me on that day he's wanting to come back to the table, do business. And now we've just got news today that Beijing and China's antitrust watchdog just gave Alibaba its endorsement, ending years-long scrutiny. And this is a bit of a signal that Beijing is wanting to come back around and support their tech companies and help them compete in a global market. Now that they've got them politically under control, as Jack Ma was starting to speak up too much against the establishment, they've rejigged their systems and controls. They still want them to grow, help propel the Chinese economy. They just don't want to feel politically threatened. We've also seen them come out with a number of other key measures as well to address their property market, which has really been the forefront along with regulatory clampdown on what's kind of choked Chinese securities the last couple of years. They've also got news out today. They're considering allowing Chinese homeowners to refi their mortgages, market worth over $5 trillion. And that could allow a lot of them to reduce borrowing costs. A lot of banks compete for those refi mortgages. And consumer confidence and sentiment is pretty low over there. And this could help put a bottom in things, get things turning around that they've been trying really hard for the last 6 to 12 months to do. Even news now of them knocking down a lot of these skyscrapers they built and are empty. They just built way too much capacity. Kind of blew up the bond market for property over there. Big flight of international capital. Depressed valuations. Clamping down on Hong Kong. Kind of just all added up to multi-years bear market. However, keep in mind, looking back in history, average bear market and equity markets is around a year and a half. They've been in one for three. So this has been considered a long bear market. And you can see that on the monthly chart of the China large cap ETF traded in New York, FXI. Picked out in early 21. But like I pointed out earlier on this year, looks like we may have completed stage one accumulation, breaking out above this trend line into the sweet spot of an early stage two advance. We've even seen their state-backed investment fund starting to actually buy shares and ETFs traded in New York directly themselves. That's a pretty clear indication and signal that they're trying to get underneath their stock market and company valuation. Everything that's done over there flows down from the top. There's no debate or pushback. If their state fund is buying these shares, it's because the CCP and Xi Jinping has permitted them to do so. And so no doubt there's still a lot of negative sentiment on China. Much of the investment world's pretty much given up on them, left them for dead, even called it uninvestable, which there is valid arguments and points to be made, certainly on that side, especially if they invade Taiwan, potential war with the US. That does muddy the picture. There's certainly unique risks to investing in China. I believe they're already compensated and well and truly reflected in today's prices. However, it's all that really negative public sentiment and mainstream media headlines that's added to these depressed valuations. And we saw that not long ago in the rag known as Time Magazine, why big tech may never recover in China. Looking back in history, whenever you see mainstream media magazines make big bold headlines, typically great 
contrarian signals. And I think a lot of people underestimate how advanced and innovative China is. I just had dinner with my cousin the other night, who's lived in China for over 12 years, and some of the things he was telling me pretty much just go directly against public perception of the place. I think a lot of people will be surprised how advanced they are in robotics, how well run a lot of their cities are, and how fast their economy is still growing. A lot of people written them off for dead, their economy is still growing at 5%. And just looking at global patent grants by country, China's well out in the lead, receiving about 38% of grants in 2021, USA 18%, Japan 16%, South Korea 10%. And unfortunately, once again, just like we see, and a lot of data out there, you have to pull out your microscope to look at Europe. Germany, France, 4 2%. Just a real lack of innovation. Along with capital formation, and that really holds back pretty much everyone over there. With modern day Europe, pretty much a shadow of what it was in the past. Nowhere near reaching its potential. However, things could be coming back, at least in the stock market, after European stocks have gone sideways for 20 years. Some of them are starting to break out, close to breaking out to all-time highs. Valuations may be starting to thaw over there, as the ECB is starting its rate cutting cycle. Eurozone also hoping for a continued soft landing. And there's a look at the popular traded Euro stocks 50 ETF in New York, FBZ. Close to breaking out to multi-year highs. However, if I zoom out, still well off the peaks from 2007. But just looking under the hood directly at the cash indices, Germany's DAX just put in its all-time record closing high this Friday session going into the weekend. And there's a look at its monthly chart. Been in a pretty steady uptrend. Not doing as well, France 40 index, which is still quite a bit off all-time highs. There's the UK FTSE, close to breaking out to all-time highs, along with the Aussie 200 as well. So we've got a bit of global equity breadth out there, which is a good sign for the bull market. And stick with me, because the end of this video, I'll show you some weekly and monthly charts on S&P 500, give you a bit of a bird's eye view of where we currently stand. Just moving on to the macro, we've got the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, personal consumption expenditures index, PCE today, coming in line as expected, even a little better. And inflation's pretty much boring again. Market doesn't seem to have a big reaction, just like we saw in the option market pricing for today. Pretty much a no-show. Market's pretty much all but concluded. Inflation is under control and trending down. Headline number coming in, showing a 0.2% increase month over month and 2.5% year over year. Meeting expectations on monthly, coming in a little better year over year and pretty much same deal on core. Year over year, 26 versus 2.7 expected. Good news is we've got PCE annualized over the last three months, tracking on a one handle lower than the Fed's inflation target of 2%. So that is a pretty good sign. And the price of commodities, crude oil, definitely been subdued for a little while now, helping out the picture a lot. But consumer spending does still make up about 70% of the economy. Very important, that's why we track it closely. It's a real mixed picture though. Because overall, it's still holding up. It's just more consumers up the top. Kind of the top 20-30% doing all the heavy lifting. When it comes to consumer sales. But the biggest thing in financial markets that's occurring right now is what you could consider the number one recession signal. And that's flashing. That's the difference between the government 10-year bond yield and the 2-year bond yield. Which went inverted in July 2022. Inflation was really creeping up. The Fed started jacking rates up in July last year. Then it started going back towards uninverted territory and it's pretty much sitting right there at break even today as I speak. Pretty much right on the verge of going into positive territory. And just looking back in history, the shaded areas on the chart here indicating a recession in the United States. Typically when the bond yield uninverts after it's been inverted for a while, we did get a False positive back in March 06. However, after it had been inverted for a while, then went back to uninverted. It's just a matter of months before the US economy went to recession. Stock market got created. And we saw that back in the late 90s as well. Bond yield curve went uninverted. A few months later, the recession. NASDAQ actually came off 80% in the first couple of years of this century. Going back again, we've seen the same pattern in the late 80s. That recession we got in the early 90s. Stock market held up pretty good in that time. And back in the late 70s, early 80s, it's a little bit more messy with the data. However, their overall pattern was inversion, uninversion, then recession. It was a tough time for market around that period. And so here we are now on the verge of repeating the same pattern. What's considered the most strongest and possibly the most accurate indicator in all finance is pretty much telling us a recession is just around the corner. And as a market observer and investor, that's just really hard to ignore and not at least take into account when deciding on your portfolio positioning going forward, of which I certainly am tilting towards companies with safer balance sheets, less debt, more defensive products, exposures to outside the United States consumer, contracts with the government, participating in secular trends, all these things can help you avoid the worst of a recession. What you want to be really careful of is companies with a lot of debt, companies with really cyclical businesses and products, companies that are really tied 
to consumer discretionary spending, companies that are trading on huge valuations, all those types of stocks are really vulnerable to big falls. Should this indicator prove right once again and the US economy is about to go into a recession, would have to be a sharp U-turn from where we currently are. However, just keep in mind when the unemployment rate does turn, it can turn quite hard and sharply. And it is pointing up now while we're getting triggers like the SARM rule. A few other things. We have been really low here for a while. You can see these big like, almost like sine waves up and down, up and down. And again, that's another indicator of a pending recession too. When you see unemployment come down really low and then turn back up quite often happens in front of a recession. And so even though things are holding up pretty good now, AI, the stock market, consumer spending, there is the real risk we could be going into a recession here. And that's just something investors should stay mindful of, even though nothing is guaranteed. So even though we go into September, the last month of Q3, we won't really know until towards the end of the month or October when some forecast expectations come in. US economy is currently growing at an annualized rate around 3%. And for us to get a recession, we need to meet that technical definition of two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. That's the US economy contracting for six months in a row. Q3 probably will come in in the high twos. We'd need to see some real weakness start developing in the coming months. Because right now, overall consumer spending is holding up. However, that doesn't mean all is well for everybody out there. Plenty of people working two jobs, struggling to put food on the table for their families. And that's because even though we've got a little bit of disinflation, there's still a lot of structurally embedded inflation out there. For a lot of people, their bills, food, is up 30, 40% over the last four years, and their pay packets are certainly most not. You can see that in the rise of multiple job holders in the US, increasing over that period as well. The big rise in the gig economy, people working jobs throughout the day, driving Ubers at night, but this has all kind of just become normal, hasn't it, over the last 50 years? A lot of people don't know any different, just think that's how it should be. And that's why I've got to share with you the most depressing chart of today, and that's the really strong correlation between the explosion in US federal debt here in the blue line, currently sitting around 33 trillion, also coinciding with the explosion in the total net worth held by the top 1% here in the red line, which believe it or not, the top 1% of Americans as measured by their wealth collectively hold $43 trillion in total net worth. And that's more than the federal debt. And I'm sorry to report that the total net worth held by the bottom 50% is not quite 3 trillion. So in other words, the top 1% has 14 times more wealth than the bottom 50% of people. However, it's the bottom 50% that'll largely be responsible along with their kids and grandkids for footing the bill of this blue line could pretty much think of it as a transfer of wealth from the public to the top one percent as modern day government policies have pretty much created this wealth inequality the huge increase in supply of us dollars and government spending that inflates assets for the benefit of the rich because inflation doesn't really affect the ultra rich if the price of their weekly groceries has gone up by 300 dollars in the last four years that wouldn't even move the needle in percentage terms and affecting their income or net wealth wouldn't even be 0.1 percent however if the bottom 50 percent if their groceries have gone up even by 100 or 200 dollars a week in the last four years that can eat as much as 50 70 percent of their discretionary spending their disposable income inflation hurts those at the bottom but benefits those at the top and the point is how far does this go What's the end game of this? Like I said, when the top 1% own 90% of everything, are the bottom 50% going to get disgruntled enough, enough social unrest to who knows, maybe one day actually push back in a real way. And again, if you study history, this has happened before in societies and it never ends well. And speaking of the top 1%, one of the most richest men in the world, Warren Buffett, turned 94 today. However, what makes him different from a lot of rich is A, He's admitted that people like him have exploited the current day rules to corner massive amounts of wealth and that it is unfair. However, that's why he's given away 99% of his wealth as well, trying to make good on it in the end. And one of his quotes that always stuck out in my mind was, what we learn from history is that people don't learn from history. Couldn't have said it better myself. But he also teaches other important lessons when it comes to investing, like independent thinking. Decisions should be based on solid facts and reasoning not popular opinion, long-term thinking, qualitative insights, having a margin of safety, concentrate with care, only investing in your circle of competence. It's okay to throw a lot of ideas in the too hard basket. Do not market guess. No one knows what's going to happen in the stock market tomorrow or the next week or two months from now. And importantly, have some skin in the game. Don't go telling people to buy a stock if you don't even own any shares yourself. Put your money where your mouth is, which a lot of people in my industry do anything but. I saw another interesting article today I thought I'd share with you guys how golfing and putting in particular can be applied to investing. I know a few of you guys golf. I also golf myself and I do find a lot 
of similarities between golf and investing. For example, you're always striving for perfection and the both of them. However, you'll never achieve it. It's a famous book in golf called Why Golf is Not a Game of Perfect. But that's what makes it so challenging and kind of addicting as well, as there's always room for improvement. And in golf, just like in investing, even the best players can make the worst shots. Emotional overthinking hurts performance. You need a plan. You need to read the lay of the ball, the wind, obstacles, risks, and you need to have a clear and healthy mind in order to make good decisions and kind of keep going through tough spots. Best golfers in the world, like a lot of sports, the best players can go through real soft patches. Loss after loss, into an injury, into more losses. However, the best players, the best investors, they hang in there and they always bounce back. And just like investing, golf can be very frustrating, but also very rewarding as well. Moving on to the economic calendar today, France's economy grown at a whopping 1% year over year. Eurozone inflation coming in line as expected, 2.2%. Canada doing a lot better. GDP growth rate annualized 2.1%, still lagging a bit behind the states. PC inflation, there's the prints we got today coming in a bit better than expected. Consumer sediment a little softer than expected. Looking out next week, manufacturing PMIs from the Eurozone to start with. Same again from the States come Tuesday. Jolts job openings on Wednesday. ADP employment, jobless claims Thursday, along with services PMIs. And then the big one, first Friday of the month, non-farm payrolls. US unemployment rate expected to come in at 4.2%. My expectation is it will come in at 4.2. I wouldn't be surprised if it comes in at 4.1. However, if we get 4.3, that could maybe shake markets a little bit. However, if we got 4.4 or even 4.5, that would definitely shake markets. I would increase my probabilities that the Fed will start with a 50 basis point cut in their new easing cycle. However, I just don't think that's likely that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which have a lot of discretion in the number they give to us, will really want to put a bad print right in front of the election. So it's possible, just not probable. But right now, the market's still giving two thirds chance that the Fed's going to cut 25 basis points next month. And I'd pretty much agree with these probabilities as they currently stand as well. Okay, since it's the end of the week and end of the month, there's a look at a weekly chart of the S&P 500. Pretty much just bouncing right back from that August 5th low. If you remember back on the end of that week, I pointed out how that was a similar bullish reversal six we got the prior couple of times. Pressing up against all-time highs here. And look at that crazy hammer candle, which you normally see at a market low. We just made at market highs. Looking at a monthly chart, the S&P almost looks like it's going into a melt-up mode if this accelerated trend stays intact. And so it's been one of the best performing election years we've ever seen. But just switching over to the NASDAQ Qs, kind of stalling out a bit there, as is the semiconductors. Just looking at the monthly chart, which has been leading the Qs, that could be a topping formation, just like we're kind of seeing with Nvidia. Often when markets top or bottom and turn, they'll consolidate at one price for a level before making the turn. However, I wouldn't rule it out at all. We did just get a good report from Nvidia, still a big boom in CapEx. This could very well break out and keep going. And just looking at small caps, not only do they look a lot better in valuations, technically speaking as well, trading really firm and not as stretched, also close to breaking out to all-time highs. There's a look at mid caps sitting below all-time highs. Dow Jones Industrial, blue chip stocks trading strong. And I also like the look of emerging market shares starting to trade up after they've been depressed for a few years now. And value stocks as well, breaking out to all-time highs. And REITs, REITs and financials looking really good, responding to the prospect of lower interest rates. They also trading firm. Commodities as a whole, still a little soft, even though we've got gold breaking out to all-time highs. And this is more to do with crude oil, which is the largest component of most commodity indices. And that's pretty much a wrap for the daily market review this week, guys. Market pretty much spent the whole week consolidating sideways. Looks like we're gonna flip this bearish engulfing candle and break out to new all-time highs next week. Market will be looking for the jobs report to come in line as expected. Other than that, pretty much everything else is looking bullish across the board. We still need a bit of work done on the growth first defensive sector spreads. However, there is big rotations into those defensive sectors. Like I said, REITs and utilities trading really firm here. So the market is definitely rotating. Thanks very much for sticking with Click Capital. Have a great long weekend and I'll see all you guys again come Tuesday night. Cheers.